a day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight by all that you hold dear on this good earth. I bid you stand, men of the West! Hello, everybody. I'm the Last Pretender. Uh, you're watching our M.A. Man sort of overview leading up to our M.A. Man Redemption series, where we're going to try and do a little bit better with M.A. Man. And uh, this time we're going to be going over Commanders. Uh, last episode, which I recommend you watch, we went over the different units and sort of different builds that you might want to look at whenever composing your army. And uh, this time we're going to be talking about the deliciousness that is the Commanders of M.A. Man. So, first, let's talk about... Uh, so, really and truly, whenever we're looking at our Commanders, there's really kind of four different things we're going to be looking at. The first one are going to be Stealth Guys. We're going to be looking at leaders, we're going to be looking at spellcasters, and we're going to be looking at researchers. So, we'll go ahead and start with uh, the stealthy boys. So, when it comes to the sneaky boys, there's quite a few uh, stealthy commanders. You've got uh, the royal forester, you've got the monk, you've got the, uh, the bard, you've got the mother of Avalon, and you've got the lord warden. Now, as far as scouting goes... Uh realistically you've got one option and the option is the monk uh the monk is going to be your best scout now you might think the royal forester is more designed to be scout he's more thematically a scout he has higher stealth um which is all true but he costs way more you're looking at 40 gold to buy one 32 gold per year to keep him whereas a monk costs 25 gold to buy one and 10 gold a year so he's three times cheaper so if a couple of them die, I mean, if you build these monks, right, if two of them die, you're still kind of doing okay on, on upkeep at least um, compared to the, uh, the Royal Forester. So I strongly believe in getting the monk. Um, the monk is an excellent unit. We'll talk about the monk a little bit more. Ah, let's actually go over the Royal Forester real quick. So the Royal Forester, um, I really don't know what you would use this guy for. Uh, I can't think of any particular talent that I would use it for. He does have higher precision than any other commander, which is nice, and you might want to put like a Just Man's Cross on him or something like that if you're dealing with like uh, Tartarians or, or, or Demon Super Combatants, something like that. But, I mean, if I was going to do that, I would probably rather put it on one of my casters and give him uh, and just have him cast like Eagle Eyes or something, right? Um, but if you were already going to be casting Wind Guide, let's say, uh, then, yeah, giving the Royal Forester uh, a ranged magic weapon might be pretty good, uh, depending on the circumstance. Uh, he's also the only one with a patrol bonus, so uh, it's probably something I actually should have used in this game, which I don't. Uh, but uh, if you have some unrest issues, uh, that can make him helpful if you're going into blood, let's say, or something like that. Uh, then I think that uh, this guy might be useful for that category. He's got four survival, which is always nice. Good stealth at 55. But other than that, there's really not a lot I would use him for. I wouldn't use him as a, as a thug or a super combatant. He doesn't have the HP pool for it, really. I, I really don't know what you'd use him for. I really don't know what I would use the Royal Forester for. Um, again, you might say scouts, right? You might say scouts, and part of that would be because of the fact that you can recruit them in all forests. So maybe you can get them faster. But generally speaking, I think you're much better off going with the monk because he's so much cheaper. Right? Your monk only costing 25 gold compared to your royal forester who costs 40. Uh, and your monk uh, having three times less upkeep because he's also a priest. Uh, there's also the fact that by having priests around, uh, the monk... I mean, it's helpful to have a level 1 priest around, right? Um, if you end up getting stuck into a, a war where your opponent is using a lot of undead, which death is a very powerful skill tree, so if they're doing skeleton spams, if you're looking at like Satis or like Airmore or something like that, who are both in this game, by the way, uh, having monks around is very, very helpful. Uh, and he's got a 40 stealth, which is still pretty good. Another nice thing about this guy is he has this odd ability called Divine Insights, which basically means you can have 
um, so many monks doing research predicated on what the dominion is in that province. So if you have a province as dominion of three, you can have three monks researching. And they don't have great research, research ability three, but they're cheap. Again, like this is a cost efficient maneuver to do this. Um, and I will do this sometimes and sometimes I won't, but it does save you money and still gets you to increase your research. So that's pretty good. It's a very gold efficient way to increase your research. Problem with this, it's sort of pro-con. So one of the things about that this is pro-con is that drain and magic do not affect the, their research. Because it's a special different weird thing, divine insights, drain and magic are not affected by this. So if you do have high drain scales, a monk is incredible. Getting monks to research everywhere is paramount. But uh, if you're going magic, which I advocate you do for, uh, for MA Man, which I'll go over a bit later, uh, these guys kind of are not as great. They kind of suffer a little bit because of that. Um, in fact, I've, that's why I've, I've tried several playthroughs where I don't get, go magic or I just go like neutral scales. I never go drain, but I'll go like neutral magic scales. I don't think it's as good. I think that you need to get your research up faster. Uh, these guys are not going to be your primary researchers. They're kind of a cheap supplement to kind of save some money. Um, and they're going to be phenomenal scouts. And a cheap level one is helpful and you can, you know, use them to, to build temples and to, to pump up uh, uh, Dominion, right? To go ahead and preach in certain places. So really an excellent unit. One of like, probably the coolest unit that MA Man has in a certain sense. One of the more distinctive ones um, and a really good one. So I really like the monk over the Royal Forester. As far as your other stealthy people, uh, you've got your bard, you've got your mother of Avalon and you've got your uh, Lord Warden. So I already mentioned this in my unit overview. I don't use Lord Wardens very much in this playthrough. I, I actually don't think I use them at all. I should have, though. Uh, now, what is Lord Warden good for? In my opinion, not a lot. He doesn't have really enough HP to be a great thug, in, in, unless you're going with some weird kind of blast. Like, he's not going to be survivable enough as a, as a thug. So, I don't like to use him as that, and I don't want to sacrifice a lot of design points on my Pretender to get him to where he could do that. I don't think it's worth it. What you would use this guy for, in my opinion? It's sort of two things. The first thing is you could use them as a raider. And what you would do is you would recruit these dudes because they're stealthy and they have really good leadership and load them up with foresters, right? Um, and then you can just have this guy hopping around with 20 or 30 foresters just raiding provinces and like he's gonna beat province defense. Unless your opponent just does a huge PD dump, um, he's gonna beat, you know, six points in province defense. So. That's what he's really good for. Another thing he's good for is he's actually good for a mobile commander, particularly for infantry later on. The reason being is that he's cap only recruit. Now, the reason you would like him later game over the Knight Commander Avalon in certain instances, the reason you might want him to command infantry is because you can recruit him from your capital, put on like Boots of Swiftness or something like that, or not Boots of Swiftness, uh, Boots of Flight or something like that, or uh, Boots of Seven Mile Stride, and you can just send him over to wherever you need him to go. Right? It's actually a really efficient way to do that. Now, I don't do that a lot with him. I don't do that with these guys. Uh, and part of the reason is I always try to keep uh, Knight Commanders of Avalon around because I use them to kind of raid a little bit because I'll load them up with some cab and have them split off of the main army to go ahead and, and, and gain some provinces that way. Um, because these guys do have naturally good map move. I don't have to equip anything on them. Um, so this saves the need for boots, but putting boots on these guys because they're not riding a horse They can wear boots. They can just be anywhere depending on how big your empire is So that's kind of the second thing you might want to use them for that one's not as I mean, you're basically fine if you just ignore that one. The biggest one is raiding I think night. I think Lord Wardens are excellent raiders um, Whenever you load them up with foresters, which can be recruited in all forests I think that's very valuable in a war and I don't do that in this game. And I should have it was my mistake but cool unit uh, I'm sad I didn't get to use them. I, I, should, I, I wish I did. I almost want to play another game now with Man. I was just, my, my last recording of this, I was like, I don't want to play Man anymore. But now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, ah, oh, man, but I could still did, I, I, could, I could have gotten a little more out of these boys. Uh, anywho, so that's what your Lord Warden is good for. So we've covered uh, the Royal Forester, the Monk. Uh, now we've got the Bard. At the end of the day, the only time I recruit the Bard is because he has the spy capacity. I don't do a lot of the instilling uprisings. Maybe I should do that more often. I don't really like it. I don't, I don't, like, I'd rather have a raider, basically, than this. 
Um, but being able to uh, to spy on enemy capitals and get their graphs, very helpful. And I do that quite a bit in this game. Uh, in fact, what I generally do is I'll make one of these guys. And being, you know, depending on how important it, I consider it, I'll make like a um, uh, Ranger's Cloak and Ranger's Boots and equip that on them, which is going to pump up their uh, their stealth from 50% to 100%. To, well, not 100%. To f stealth from 50 to 100 um, which makes it very unlikely that they get caught at that point. And then with 100 stealth, I just go send them over to enemy caps and, and uh, try to infiltrate. Uh, you can use these guys as spell, sling as spell singers, as like communion slaves and stuff like that. Um, especially if you're trying to bring a stealthy group on over. I generally stray away from using these guys as, as, uh, as that sort of thing. And the reason being is that whenever it comes to being like, like low level magic casters or, um, or researchers or, uh, or, or, or chorus slaves, I much prefer the daughter of Avalon. She only costs 10 gold more. Uh, but her morale is, uh, her, uh, her, in, her upkeep is way cheaper, right? He costs 60, where she costs nearly half that at 34. Um, so I'd rather save a little bit of money on the Daughters of Avalon. I, there are instances when you'd want to have the stealth mechanic available, um, but I generally prefer getting the Daughters. Um, also, uh, you'll notice that she has better research as well, and a little bit more magic on her. So, uh, But yeah, this guy's good for a spy. That's what I use them for. Um, I'm not really sure I'd want to use them for anything else, but uh, they're they're quality spies. So, the mothers of Avalon um, are stealthy units. I don't use their stealth too much. Um, they can be okay raiders. They can be okay. Um, the thing that I only really ever use their stealth for is to dodge magic phase attacks. Other than that, I don't use it for a lot of stuff. Um, one other thing you could use them for, though. Uh, and I don't really run into the danger of that in this game, but um, one thing that you can use a Mother of Avalon for, and I've done before, is you use them as anti uh, as, as anti raiders, right? Uh, what you do is you send them across your your empire in, in weak provinces and set them on stealth. Um, being that they have often nature two, or sometimes they'll have air two, um, you load them up with a couple magic gems, um, and you just go ahead and just have them sneak attack. Just and have them cast uh, Swarm or um, Creeping Doom, something like that. Uh, that can be quite helpful. So you can use them as anti-raiders. Um, another thing you can use them for, or, or they can summon large ele air elementals if they're in air two. You load them up with gems, they can summon a, a large air elemental, which can mess up stuff pretty bad. Um, and that's a utility you can use with their stealth mechanic. Other than that, I really don't use them a lot for their stealthiness, but it's nice to have. So dodging magic face attacks and using them to like catch elves and that sort of thing with stealth attacks, that can be helpful. Um, but uh, that's all for the stealthiness stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about our leaders, which we did mention a little bit whenever it comes to Lord of Wardens. So whenever we're talking about leaders of men, we're gonna be looking at the Castellan, we're gonna be looking at the Knight Commander Avalon, we're going to be looking at the Lord Wardens, and interestingly enough, we will look at the Crone. The reason we look at the Crone specifically is because she has uh, the only one that has decent magical leadership, right? She has a 25 magical leadership, and so at certain points during late game and stuff like that, you're probably going to have some magical units, and you're going to want somebody with some magical leadership, and she's the best that you got. Uh... Otherwise, as far as leadership goes, you've got your Castellan, your Lord Warden, and your Knight Commander. I never get the Castellan, and the reason is, is because, like, the Lord Warden is just, like, an objectively superior guy. Yes, he costs, um, more money. I think he actually... How much more upkeep is he? They're pretty close in upkeep. He's more expensive, but, like, these are your commanders you're talking about. I feel like you should splurge on your commanders. Your commanders should be high quality. Um, you don't want to go cheap on your commanders, and these guys basically get a lot more tankiness right they get higher protection than these dudes this dude only has a what is it a 15 protection as opposed to a uh, an 18 for this guy much better um i'd rather get these guys they have a little bit of a sacredness to them they can stealth and get out of a situation if they have to i i would never i would almost never get a castellan over a lord warden if i can get a lord warden i get a lord warden 
and I find that you can get, even in a game if you have like a very large empire, you can probably supply all your armies with Lord Wardens, or even Knight Commanders really, but Lord Wardens in particular because you can recruit two of them a turn, because they're, uh, wait, leadership points, where, where is it? I don't know, I'm losing my mind. Oof. Is it recruitment point? Yeah, it's recruitment point. Nope. I'm so... I apologize. It's gonna bother me. There's a thing that tells you. I don't know where it is. But anyway, there... You can recruit one... You can recruit two of these dudes a turn. Right? Whereas, like, you can only recruit one Knight Commander Avalon. So. I would always recruit Lord Wardens. Now, I tend to go with Knight Commanders over Lord Wardens, and I'm going to in this game for a couple reasons. The first one being is that I can use them as raiders a little more comfortably. What I like to do is, like, because they can dart around the map more without any magic items because they have higher movement speed. In fact, um, they have even better map move than uh, than your uh, Knights of Avalon, so they're not restricted in any way by that. That can be quite helpful, um, especially if you're shuttling, because you're building these guys from cap. If you're going to be shuttling Knight, Knights of Avalon over there, um, you can just get these guys and they'll move them as fast as humanly possible, right? Even if you got these guys and gave them boots, they wouldn't be able to move them any faster because they would be limited by the speed of the Knights of Avalon. So I like going Knight Commanders of Avalon. They're pretty much extensively what I get. I also like them better than the Lord Wardens as leaders of an army because they have shields, right? So they're less likely to get sniped out by a random crossbow bolt or something like that. Um, you have less accidents basically happen. And... They have the ever valuable quality of recuperation. So yeah, I mean, roughly speaking, these guys these guys are going to cost you more in the long run because they cost more gold per year because they're not sacreds, right? Sixty four as opposed to what was that? Ninety six. So these guys are going to cost you more in the long run, but like, um, like I said, they have a shield, which prevents boo boos. They have recuperation, which means that they'll heal up whenever they take um, a wound or something like that. They've got better defensive stats, obviously. They're just a little bit more survivable, and that's what I want out of my, uh, that's what I want out of my commanders. I want them survivable with good leadership. And these guys are survivable with good leadership, and they have higher movement speed, um, which can help them shuttle knights around, very, knights of Avalon in particular, very, very well. So, as far as the leaders go, I, I just, I go all in on the knight commanders of Avalon. Um, I do like the Lord Wardens. I, I wish I'd used them more for raiding. It's, it's going to eat me so bad. But that's what I wish um, I had gotten more of. It's eating at me. But uh, I really like the Knight Commander Avalon as far as Commanders of Troops go. Now, we get into our casters. So as far as casters go, uh, if you count the priests, you've got them. If you've got priests, if you count priest abilities, you've got the monk, you've got the bard, You've got the Daughters of Avalon, the Mothers of Avalon, the Crones of Avalon, and the Wise Wiseman. So let's go through them one at a time. Your monks are great priests. They're level one priests that are ultra cheap. Okay, if you're going up against somebody who's going to be spamming out a lot of undead, having you can just get a lot of monks for cheap. You can get them anywhere. They're not cap only. Uh, they're just awesome. So I love getting them uh, if I'm dealing with that sort of thing. And another nice thing is because they're such cheap and if they're such gold efficient researchers that like it's nice to just get a bunch of have a bunch of them hanging around anyway doing research and then if you end up in a war with Statis or whatever you can just pull these guys you can just pull them off the bench and throw them into battle and that's something that I really value I really value being able to take a researcher I hate whenever you just have units that are just pure researchers they're just lab monkeys and they're not going to do anything they're just going to sit there and research and if I go to war they do nothing they contribute nothing to me um, so I like having units that if I'm in, if I'm under the gun, I can pull them off the bench and send them into, into battle and they can contribute. So really like these guys for that. They're, I mean, they're, they're, if, I, if, I, if I need priests, they're excellent go-tos. Next, you've got the bard. I never use them for their casting abilities. Uh, I never do. Uh, and I think I've kind of already gone over why, basically, um, which is that roughly you can get a very similarly priced Daughter of Avalon with lower upkeep that's even a better caster. So... And I, I don't value stealth so much that I would get the bards over the Daughters of Avalon. So, uh, that's really all I have to say about the bard. Daughter of Avalon, what are these ladies good for? I like them, generally speaking, to just be communion slaves. Um, I like them to be communion slaves. They can work as masters too, right? Especially like the nature twos. Um, they can work as masters too. I'd rather use them as communion slaves uh, because they're cheaper. They're a little more disposable. Um... 
and uh, that's basically what the situation is with them. Uh, they're not priest levels. They don't have the flexibility that a mother does. Um, I recruit these when I'm specifically trying to get a large number of slaves. Um, and the reason is, is basically I'm going to have to compare them to the mothers for this. The mothers provide me with a lot more flexibility. The first thing is that mothers are priests. Okay? Daughters are not priests, they're only sacred. So if I'm in a situation where I need them to cast a lot of banishments, um, and I couldn't predict it, my mothers can do it. And my daughters obviously can't. The second thing is that mothers are a little bit stronger spellcasters, which is nice. The third thing is that mothers are going to give me more research per turn. They're not really as they're not as cost efficient per research point. They're not as gold efficient, but they're more efficient per turn, right? In one turn, I can recruit. It is recruitment points, isn't it? Oh no, that's right. A knight commander does require. You can get two in a turn. You can get two knight commanders in a turn. You can only get one mother though, because their recruitment points is two. Okay, I was right. Just I was stupid. Is what happened. But back to my point. These these ladies, you're gonna get more research per turn which I value highly as man, um, because of the fact that man does not have great sacreds, because they have good military, they have good units, but they don't have as dominant as, for example, M.A. Alm, right? Or Abyssia, or something like that. Because they're not as strong and as dominant as them, I, I, I really value research as man. And because they've got two excellent spell schools that they prioritize in, which is air and nature. And so because of that, like, really getting as much research as you can per turn i find very very valuable and these are the most research per turn that you can get right these are 17 but it takes you two turns to recruit them um these dudes have terrible research so these are your most research turn efficient um they're gonna make you stronger spell casters um so that they like a level two can cast uh arrow fin basically right away um with just an extra gym cost um Whereas you're ne never going to be able to get that um, with a daughter without putting her into communion. Um, they have more flexibility being that they're priests as well. They've got more turn efficiency in their research. And they have the increased capacity to sometimes get water or earth. Which are both very valuable, right? Water, a level 1 water mage can basically climb all the way up to the top. Right? You can basically get whatever you want with a level 1 water mage pretty cheaply. Like this basically gets you into water. A level 1 water mage basically gets you in, right? Uh... It's only, what is it, 30 gold? It's only 30 water gems to upgrade you to water 2. You can put on a, a bracelet. Bracelets are, uh, bracelets only cost 10 water gems. That gets you to level 3. Then you can put on the water chest. I forget what it's called. Um, once you have a water 3 uh, mage, you can, uh, you can make the chest. And that gets you into water 4. And it's like, I mean, you basically have unlocked water at that point. So, that's excellent. They can also get the earth, and the earth ones are actually kind of valuable because, and we're going to be talking about communions in a second, uh, because you can put them as a communion master and have them cast summon earth and power, which is going to increase the the rejuvenation of uh, of all of your slaves, and so that's going to really help your communions be stronger. So, I really like that as well. So, mothers of Avalon, excellent unit. Um, and I, I recruit them as my mainstay for combats because I want to get that, that variability. I want to have a lot of water mages and earth mages and that sort of thing. I want to increase my magic um, my magic diversity as much as I can. And so I recruit a ton of these. They give me the most uh, research efficiency per tick. And they're pretty good battle mages. Mothers of Avalon are kind of my meat and potatoes uh, spellcasters. I'm only going to be really recruiting Daughters of Avalon when I want to load up on slaves. When I just want a ton of slaves to power my communions to do all kinds of crazy nonsense. That's what I'm going to be getting them because they're cheaper. Now, as far as the Crones of Avalon, when do I recruit them? Well, uh, whenever, a lot of times when I need a little extra water, when I need a little extra nature or air magic. They can pick up water. They can pick up earth. Don't be betting on them to get an Earth um, an Earth 2 or a Water 2. Very uncommon. Very uncommon that you get an Earth 2 or a Water 2. Uh, so I, I really don't depend on them for that. But I will get them to try and get maybe like a Nature 4 or an Air 3. Right? If, maybe I want an Air 3 so I can cast Storm right away. Or maybe I need a Nature 4 because it gets me... Um, if I put on like a Bracelet and give them a, a, a Thistle Mace, that gets her to... Uh, 
to nature six and there's certain uh rituals i might want to cast for that so whenever i need a little bit of a bump i'll go ahead and recruit these ladies i generally i generally stray away from them particularly in early game because they're so expensive because they take two turns to recruit because they're older um because you know they definitely cost a lot of upkeep as well i don't really like them that much overall but i will grab them um if i need something like that uh one thing i didn't mention uh valuable mothers of avalon besides the ones that have air uh, besides the ones that have earth and water are the ones that have air too because like i said they can summon air elementals like that um and they can cloud trapeze so for example if you've got a raider who's bouncing around being obnoxious inside of your territory or even a super combatant you can cloud trapeze these ladies in load it up with air gems they all summon air elementals and the air elementals just run them down and trample them to death another thing is nature threes are good if you want to turn one cast serpent's blessing right if you've got a nature three let's say that's got a water on them as well she can right away cast foul vapors um and you know so nature nature threes are really good also nature threes can automatically cast charm which is a very powerful spell a very very powerful nature spell um the air twos are very good as well uh because again that gets you closer to being able to cast thunder strike and stuff like that so um once you uh if you have storm up right and you cast summon storm power boom you're you're spitting out a lot of fire all of a sudden very very quickly with uh air threes so really um and the nature twos aren't bad either because the nature tombs can at least cast creeping doom um and with the air magic they can you know dabble into a little bit of there even then they can still cast thunder strike and i mean not thunder strike lightning bolt and stuff if uh if storm is up and that sort of thing so there's a lot of good stuff they can do with these um put them in a chorus and they can cast basically any nature or any air mag mage magic that you want and uh if you're just recruiting these from all your forts you're gonna have a whole variety of them that can do all kinds of stuff so a very very useful unit a very very good unit really really like them so uh so that's whenever i get the the mothers the mothers have a large variety of stuff that they can do the crones like i said i usually recruit them trying to get a specialty kind of one that's going to have a little bit of extra air or nature on them and even then it's very rarely that useful um because of choruses and stuff like that unless i really need a high speed cast but even then i'm gonna have problems because they're all spell singers so that's the mothers let's go ahead and talk about our last caster which is the logrian wiseman now the logrian wiseman is really nice so he's an automatic earth earth mage which is not helpful he does let you splash into fire he's the one fire guy you can get um now fire is a little bit trickier to kind of hammer into but if you can get one fire boosted item just one pay your neighbor or whatever to get a, a flaming skull or something like that and you get a, a fire of these you can empower them for 30 gems bring them to fire two give them the fire booster bring them to fire three and at fire three you can summon flame spirits and now you're in fire right so very useful unit for that um their research is terrible you're not getting them for that um and then the other big one that you're going to want to get for these guys is the earth twos earth twos are incredibly helpful because it lets you break into earth once you have earth two you can forge earthen boots you basically take uh, earthen boots put it on an earth two um have them cast summon earthen power now you've got an earth four and you can you've you've unlocked earth right give them enough earth gems and then cast anything also with earth twos they're going to be able to cast uh, gnome lore and that sort of thing um so they're going to be able to just totally site search uh remote site search all your provinces for earth for earth gems uh they're excellent they're excellent units oh another thing too is that horus bex is going to be important for your uh nature two mothers of avalon because they're going to be able to site search remotely for uh nature gem sites in all your places as the same thing with all specs for air and you get the idea anywho but yeah the earth twos of these guys are a huge deal right huge deal to get earth twos because it lets you it lets you get uh because with earth two you can forge the uh the earthen boots and now you've got earth threes you got an earth three summon earth and power he's an earth four you can cast all the earth spells basically outside of some extreme circumstances but you can cast a lot i mean you know weapons of sharpness if you gym them up uh maws of the earth um all kinds of stuff so excellent excellent units excellent excellent units so getting these guys going uh with those earth gems is going to be very very necessary for you and i believe that's basically all the commanders uh, i'm trying to think if there's anything else i really didn't talk about too much 
Um, I do recommend, one of the things that, I, I don't know if I do it quite, I don't, I don't think I do it actually in this playthrough, but whenever you're building your initial, uh, initial forts, um, if you're confident you're not going to be invaded, build the lab first so you can put them to work uh, recruiting a Logrian Wiseman because you want to get these earth these earth guys as fast as you can because earth is a really good I mean basically all magic is good magic right every single school of every single um, I'm gonna call it a school it's not really a school though every single path of magic is very good and you want to have all the paths the more paths you have the stronger you are because the more options you have to deal with problems and so getting these guys quickly is helpful it lets you tap into fire lets you tap into earth they're pretty much banging a really underestimated unit, I think, in the roster. Um, so, just a, a kind of quick overview we'll go over real fast. It's going to be uh, we've got our monks, who are very uh, who are very good. They're going to be mainstays of priests and cheap, cheap researchers to round them up, and they're going to be our number one scouts. Um, we're going to be recruiting daughters of Avalon from time to time to load up on communion slaves whenever we need those. Uh, core slaves, I'm sorry, whenever we need those. Mothers of Avalon are extraordinarily good. They're going to be our primary uh, uh, sort of uh, battle mages. Um, we're going to recruit a couple of crones from time to time for some specialty reasons. And we're going to be getting uh, Logri and Wisemen. We're going to be setting up provinces specifically to recruit them so that we can rack up earth magic and fire magic. Um, now, one thing I do want to talk about that I, I, I just remembered and I hadn't even mentioned is that Unlike other nature mages, these are very special. So all of our mages who can cast nature magic have a special ability called Spellsinger. Now what Spellsinger does is it lets you form communions, okay? Uh, they don't have to be astral communions. They are specifically what they're called choruses. Now, <clears throat> that means that you can have communions formed with these guys, which means that you have access to incredible spell casting capacity. This is how you're able to cast things like Fog Warriors and things like that. Uh, Fog Warriors is a huge spell for MA Man, really pumps up their firepower, makes them far more dangerous of the military force. Um, it's going to let them spam out a ton more Thunder Strikes late game um, and makes their, their evocation really devastating late game. It's kind of one of the few really advantages they're going to have other, over a lot of nations late game. Uh, some things to note about uh, Spellsinger. So there's some good news and some bad news associated with this as well. So the obvious good news is that you have the ability to form communions uh, that are nature and air. And that's very, very good. Having nature and air communions are just excellent, okay? It's gonna make it a lot easier to cast a lot of different spells. You're gonna be casting things like um, mass protection, mass regeneration, uh, like I said, Serpent's Blessing before. Um, you're gonna be casting um, foul vapors, um, lots of nature stuff that's really good. Relief from time to time is good as well. You're also going to be able to cast things like Fog Warriors, Storm, really easily uh, because of these communions. Other good news about the spell, the spell singer capacity is that it takes less fatigue whenever they um, but also takes fat less fatigue. Is it supposed to say flat? I thought it took thirty percent less. I'd have to double check that. Um, I don't really concern myself with it too much in this game, but they do take less fatigue whenever they uh, they cast spells. So that's very helpful, obviously, right? You're basically able to shell out more magic that way. It makes your it fundamentally makes your mages more powerful. Now, a disadvantage of Spellslinger is the time. And time can be a big deal, particularly if, for example, you're dealing with certain spells that can rock you. So let's say your opponent's casting Earthquake. Um having it take longer for you to cast spells that protect you from earthquake like let's say aerofend or um actually i'm not sure if aerofend does mass flight mass flight i was thinking about earthquake inside of a cave but let's say mass flight uh i'm not sure if, if aerofend would help you in a cave I actually don't think it does it might though anyway let's say you're not in a cave someone casts earthquake you want to cast mass flight before he's able to do that before he's able to kill a bunch of your mages I earthquake will beat you because your spell singers are slower to cast spells. That's kind of a problem. Let's say your opponent's casting mass fight, you want to cast storm so that they don't attack your backline or get in amongst your mages. Well, it's gonna take you a little bit longer to get the storm off, so they might be able to get into there. So that's kind of a big disadvantage of the spell singer. The big advantage being that it costs less fatigue for them to cast these spells. Another thing to note about their communions 
um, that they're able to do with Spellsinger is, is two things. The first thing is that, yes, Astral Mages can join it. The way it works is that you set your, your spell singers to go Chorus Slave, and you have your Astro Mage, have them, make sure you set them to Communion Master. If you set them to Chorus Master, because it'll have the option for you to script Chorus Master, and it'll tell you that that's okay, and you can do that, but it won't actually join the Chorus. You have to go with Communion Master, and then he will join the Chorus, and he will take the benefits of powering up from that. So Astro Mages can join a spell singer Communion. The second thing about Spellsinger Communions that are different is that it doesn't kill them. You can't burn out a mage as a slave. So normally the way it works is that once you've tapped out of fatigue, I believe it's once you've hit 200? I think it's once you've hit 200 fatigue in a communion. Um, I believe that's what it is. You start to take damage for every point over 200 fatigue that you're consumed, that your spell, that your uh, communion slave takes, right? Every point over, every, every point over they start to take damage. With spell singers, once they hit a hundred fatigue, they actually drop out of the communion. Um, they they basically pass out and they're no longer part of the communion. They're they're no longer empowering it. The good news is is that this means that you can kind of play a little bit faster and looser with uh, spell singer communions and not worry so much about blowing up your communion batteries. That's the good news. The bad news is is that uh, you can't make them as awesome, right? If you go ahead and cast like if you cast like mass mass regeneration on them all and go ahead and cast mass relief um you would be able to have these guys churning forever um and so that would be cool because they would never die and they would be able to cast a bajillion spells uh but that might be too strong although i'm not actually sure it would be because being human is such a problem but uh it does make sense being that they have to literally sing the idea is supposed to be that uh hey don't it hurts me what I'm about to say hurts me. It hurts me to say this because it is. I'm not going to say I'm a racist, but I uh, I hate a certain race, and that is elves. I hate elves. I hate elves. I hate them, and I think that they're obnoxious. They're always so snooty. They always act like they're better than everybody else. They have like infinitely better stats. They live forever. They're beautiful. It's the they're just. I don't want to hear it. Okay, go at just. And, and then, like, fighting an elf is like... Like, fighting elves are like fighting cancer. Like, it's like you have to stop it before it spreads and it gets everywhere. It's just... I hate it. Um, hate elves. Anyway, point is, is that, uh, lore-wise, they basically learned this from elves. Okay? It's basically what happened. The, the Spellslingers know the ways uh, that were, that were uh, once practiced of, of basically elves and Tyrannodog and such. But these are not elves. Though I think it's actually suggested that the wardens might be elves. I kind of forget. But they might have like elven blood or something. Yeah, they're descendants of the Tuatha. And Tuatha are basically elves. Anywho. Uh, so, they have to sing in order to maintain the communion. So once they get 100 fatigue, they pass out. Um, but like I said, they, they consume less fatigue. Because of the fact that they're spell singers. And um, that's pretty cool. And you can have a whole bunch of dudes doing it. And because, I mean, you're getting pretty cheap mages at 85 gold and uh because they're sacred it's the it's only costing you 35 gold a year you can have pretty massive communion so you really are not terribly concerned about this now there's another thing that's really good about man and i mentioned this in my unit point which is that man is exceedingly good at cracking forts and the reason being is because they have a supply bonus um, because they're nature mages and such um, almost all of their spellcasters, in fact, I think all of them except for the Logrians, yeah, all their spellcasters provide bonus supply. Um, 10 for most of them, I believe, and 30, yeah, and 30 for the, um, for the crones. So what this means is, is that because you're probably going to be toting a ton of mages around to maintain your communions and such, or your choruses and such, um, you just don't even have to worry about supplies. So you can build phenomenally large armies and not have to worry about starving to death and that's on top of the fact that if you are under the gun you can still make endless bags of wine um that of wish or the giant broth if you don't have the, quite the construction level for that um so that way you guys don't starve to death um which is extraordinarily helpful obviously in fielding massive armies uh and that's something that hugely benefits you especially if you're going to be going with like um longbowmen or with like landless knights or something and so you have these huge armies you're going to pop forts just like that really really helpful um 
and so that's a, another big boon to man is that that kind of snowballs into they're having pretty good units and that sort of thing they can also field these massive armies and not worry about uh, the repercussions of that um also interestingly enough they actually don't hate going to war with airmore it's kind of a niche issue but they don't hate it and the reason they don't hate it i've actually had to go to air with, i've played man in quite a few games and a lot of games i've had to go to war with airmore and they're actually not bad at it because they can get very cheap priests and they can load up with heavy supplies they have a heavy supply bonus so that way they don't have to worry about starving to death in the pop kill zones and um they can just get a ton of monks rolling around so they're actually pretty good at dealing with that uh yeah that's uh that's basically as far as the casters go um i think i'll make one more video because this one's gone on for quite a while i'm probably going to make one more video talking a little bit about spells that we're going to be looking at as ma man particularly in the early game mainly is what i'll be focusing on and kind of things to look at for and research goals uh so that, that way we can kind of have our final overview of man and then i'll probably do another video based around what pretender i'm going to be using so uh, still a lot more to go when talking about man uh, hopefully this isn't too stretched out or boring but i try to be thorough here so that, that way this sort of uh odd nation can get get its love you know because we really want to try and redeem ourselves here so in any event uh i certainly appreciate you watching i've been the last pretender i'll see you guys next time